So now that we've developed the intuition for why every convergent sequence is bounded, namely that because it's convergent, we can choose an epsilon and use the definition of convergence to then divide the sequence into a head and a tail based on when that sequence is guaranteed to be within epsilon of its limit, so it's within epsilon of its limit in the tail, and it does whatever else it wants to back in the head of the sequence. Now that we've developed that intuition, how do we actually structure the proof that this convergent sequence must therefore be a bounded sequence? So that's what we're headed into next. So let's take a quick inventory of what it is that we know and what it is that we want to demonstrate is true. So what we know is we know that Sn is a convergent sequence. So we have the definition of convergence, which is like a little machine uh, that we can use to plug any epsilon greater than zero that we want to into the convergence definition. And the definition will produce for us a capital N with the property that for all little n's greater than or equal to that capital N, the sequence Sn will be within a distance of epsilon of its limit. So that we know. That's a definition that we can call upon whenever we need it, just by supplying it an epsilon and receiving its capital N. Meanwhile, what we want to prove is we want to prove that Sn is bounded. And so the definition of boundedness, that there exists a real number m, such that for all natural numbers n, every single one of the terms of the sequence Sn is less than or equal to m in absolute value. That definition of boundedness is now what's going to structure our proof. So we can look at the quantifiers in that definition and point out that here, where I have a universal quantifier, that's going to correlate in my proof to the statement, let's let n, a natural number, be arbitrarily chosen. And the burden of proof for us is to figure out how to construct this capital M. And so somewhere, we're going to have a statement like, define m to be something. And we decided, based on our intuition from the argument on this slide right here, that the way to get my m, my bound, my upper bound, for all the terms in the sequence, is to take the larger, of the upper bound of all of the terms in the head of this sequence, and the L plus epsilon, which serves as an upper bound for the entire tail of my sequence. So take the upper bound for the head, take the upper bound for the tail, and just take the larger of those two. So a way to write that is just it's the maximum of the absolute value of all the terms in the head of the sequence, of which there are finitely many, and then L plus epsilon, which is going to be a bound for all the rest of the terms, the infinitely many that are in the tail. And I promised that there would be a place where we have to reckon a little bit with sign. And how we do that is we'll just take the L, which because the limit could be negative, it could be positive. And so we don't know whether we want a ceiling or whether we want a floor. We really need it to work for both. And we'll just take the absolute value of the L. Uh, we'll see why that works here in a minute. Uh, so we're going to just define M to be the upper bound of all the absolute values of the terms in the head, comma, the upper bound absolute value of L plus epsilon that's going to bound our tail. But the problem is, looking at this definition right now, we haven't told the reader everything that the reader needs to know to understand where all this stuff is coming from. We haven't told the reader what n is, what l is, what epsilon is, and so that's a clue that we're missing something in our proof prior to this definition. So let's figure out where this n, l, and epsilon are all going to come from. Well, the only place that they can come from is from what we know about the sequence Sn. And what we know is that Sn is a convergent sequence. And so those quantities are going to have to come from an invocation of the convergence definition. In other words, a use of this definition machine over here. So we have to supply the machine with an epsilon. It will produce us uh, a capital N. And the capital N it gives us is going to satisfy that all n's greater than or equal to that capital N will uh, satisfy Sn minus L is less than epsilon in absolute value. OK, so I can write that statement down, but I still haven't defined for my reader where epsilon comes from. So what's the question? The question is, what epsilon are we going to stick into this machine to produce an n that will let us continue the rest of our argument? Notice that it didn't matter when we were developing our intuition back on this slide. It didn't matter what epsilon we chose. I just sort of chose 0.26 in this particular example, right? But it doesn't really matter which epsilon is chosen, because the only thing that we really need epsilon to do is to produce for us this n, which divides our sequence into a head and a tail. So that's the good news. It doesn't matter what epsilon we provide into this definition. So as the author of this proof, we could be non-committal. And we could just say, oh, let's just choose any epsilon greater than 0. And I'm saying, let's let it be chosen. But I'm not saying arbitrarily chosen, because this is sort of us, not the universe, choosing a value for epsilon. If we wanted to really emphasize um, the fact that it's us choosing this epsilon and not the universe, we could even be really concrete about it and say something like, let's let epsilon equal 1. Why not? Right. 
we just need to have any epsilon to stuff into the definition of convergence to produce us our n, which divides the head terms from the tail terms. So if we wanted to be real specific, we could just say, let's let epsilon equal 1. That way the reader knows that it's us picking this value and not the universe. And the good news is, the rest of this argument will work no matter what epsilon was chosen, um, because that's how we're getting our n. That's really the only purpose that epsilon serves. So now at this point in the proof, we've introduced the reader to epsilon, we've used the definition of convergence to introduce the reader to n, and l is the limit of the sequence, which again is also part of this definition of convergence. So now all of our terms are defined uh, in the definition that produces our capital M for us. So we just have to finish the argument and tell the reader why for any n, any natural number n at all, which is arbitrarily chosen, this one is chosen by the universe, why is it true that the absolute value of Sn is less than or equal to m? And as you might expect from our intuition, the answer to why that's true is going to be different if my little n is an index of one of the terms in the head of the sequence, or whether it's the index of one of the terms in the tail of the sequence. So that argues for probably a two-case approach to the conclusion of this proof. There's a different reason for why the absolute value of these terms is less than or equal to m than there is for why the absolute value of those terms is less than or equal to m. So we'll break into two cases. One case that will work for the head of the sequence, and one case that will work for the tail of the sequence. If I choose one of the terms in the head of my sequence, in other words, if n is less than capital N, that means I'm in the head of the sequence, then the absolute value of Sn is going to be the absolute value of one of these terms. And therefore, we know that that absolute value is going to be bounded by the maximum of the absolute values of all these terms in the head. In other words, this green upper bound that we began our intuition with. So we'll say that the absolute value of Sn is less than or equal to the max of the absolute values of all the terms in the head of the sequence. That should be a capital N there, I'm sorry. But then that max has to be less than or equal to this max, because it's the same set that we're taking the max of, we're just adding one more possibility here. So that means that that's got to be less than or equal to the max of both the head and the tail of the sequence, which is what we call them. And therefore, for the terms in the head of the sequence, we've shown why the absolute value of Sn is less than or equal to m. The terms in the tail are bounded by m for a different reason. So if n is greater than or equal to capital N, that means that my Sn is one of the terms in the tail. And I need to somehow figure out why the absolute value of this Sn is less than or equal to this capital M. And here, we'll employ an add and subtract trick. Because this absolute value of Sn is measuring the distance of my terms from 0, and what I really want to do is measure the distance of my terms from the limit of the sequence, which is L. So anytime we're trying to shift the point of comparison for distance uh, in an absolute value, an add and subtract trick is a way that we can do that. So we'll add and subtract L inside of my absolute value. That's going to let me then use the triangle inequality to split apart this addition with a less than or equal to sign. So the absolute value of Sn minus L plus L is less than or equal to the absolute value of Sn minus L, so the distance of the nth term from its limit, plus the absolute value of L. But this quantity, absolute value of Sn minus uh, L, because we've assumed N is greater than or equal to the capital N for which Sn minus L is less than epsilon in absolute value by the definition of convergence, we have an estimate on this first term to be less than epsilon. And if that's less than epsilon plus the absolute value of L, because epsilon plus the absolute value of L is one of the elements in this set of which the max defines M, that must mean that this quantity is less than or equal to that max, which is what we're calling M. And that covers both of the possible cases to demonstrate that the absolute value of Sn is less than or equal to M no matter what index little n that we've chosen. And that completes our proof. So looking back at this, what did we do? The universe chose an epsilon for us. Or, we could be really concrete about it, because we only need an epsilon in this proof to produce for us an n, which divides our sequence into a head and a tail. Maybe we could say, let's let epsilon be 1. Because Sn is a convergent sequence, we can then use that epsilon to produce a capital N that divides my sequence into a head and a tail, and every one of the tail terms in the sequence is going to be within an epsilon's distance of the limit, L. And then we define capital M, which is going to be the bound for my entire sequence, as the largest among the absolute values of all the first capital N terms, that's the head of the sequence, and absolute value of L plus epsilon. That's going to furnish the upper bound for the tail.
of our sequence. And then for any natural number n, which the universe chooses for us arbitrarily, either that n produces a term which is in the head of the sequence, in which case the absolute value of Sn is bounded by the absolute value of the finite list of terms which are in the head of the sequence, which is then less than or equal to m. Or, if the universe has chosen a tail term, then the absolute value of Sn will, because of this added subtract trick, be bounded from above by epsilon plus the absolute value of L, because the definition of convergence has pr provided us with an upper bound for that tail. And then that's less than or equal to m as well. This is a proof that's well worth reviewing, both for its intuitive aspects, so how we reasoned our way logically into this construction, um, but also how we transformed that intuition, that reasoning, into a carefully structured proof that introduces the reader to every quantity before it gets used in an argument, and then uses the appropriate definitions to tell us where these numbers are actually coming from.